B. Collins. Peter B. Collins, news and comment. It's Monday, February 13th, 2017. We've got a leaky dam in Oroville, California. But the bigger leaks are coming from the intelligence community in Washington, D.C. Just ask Mike Flynn. We've got so much news that there isn't room for it all today, but I'm going to do my best to comment on as much as I can. Every day I try to pick the top 10 or so stories that I think deserve coverage. Some are covered by the corporate media, some are not. And today we are seeing here in California a vigil at the Oroville Dam. That's about 90 miles north of Sacramento. And over the weekend, they had to use the spillway to allow water out of the dam, which was at 98% of its capacity. And the spillway, which has not been used much in its 50 years of, uh, since it was constructed, uh, buckled and large caverns appeared, and this caused the water to spill all over the dam place. And then they were forced by the increasing rising waters to use an emergency spillway that caused erosion along the wall that the water was pouring over and the landscape below it. And that caused the evacuation of almost 200,000 people on short notice on Sunday afternoon. Now, the authorities had held a news conference at roughly noon Pacific time and said, uh, no need to evacuate. We're monitoring the situation. We believe the dam will hold. And the dam itself does not appear to be vulnerable. But this spillway arrangement, which is just a large earthen wall, appears to be quite vulnerable. And so we're watching this carefully. There isn't uh, rain predicted for another couple of days. So they're going to try to uh, helicopter piles of rocks <laughs> into this big sinkhole and see if they can shore up the uh, spillway and the emergency spillway. And uh, this is uh, something that comes with our recovery from the drought. We have too much rain this winter. And... We don't know exactly how the rest of the season will play out. There's a massive snowpack in the mountains that will melt and flow into the Oroville Reservoir and down into the Feather River. And this could produce flooding uh, either right away or uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, the rainy season and the snowpack will uh, both kind of uh, uh, fade out by the end of April. So March and April are going to be very serious months of potential crisis here in California. But as I mentioned, the leaks in Washington are much bigger. And one thing that has leaked out of the Trump White House today is a threat to the state of California. Now, Governor Jerry Brown has already submitted a request for federal funds for the disasters of previous storms asking the feds for $162 million. Now, this is routine. The money's in the budget, but a source quoted by a Sacramento-based alternative newspaper, The Dispatch, quotes a, an unnamed White House insider. The president has no incentive in helping the state of California. The state harbors more illegal immigrants than any other state and has multiple sanctuary cities that violate federal laws. Now, this, of course, is irrational connectivity. But that's how a mind like Trump's works. The state very publicly supported Hillary Clinton. The president views the state as being responsible for his loss in the popular vote. California has also recently threatened to leave the union. No, we haven't. There are some people who are talking about it. That is not an official position of the state of California or your humble host. But then they have to go into deep dive on libtards. Quote, there is a sickness within liberals in this country that they are not willing to address. Until they understand what ails them, they, can they hope to find the cure? Wow. Now, this is a personal expression. I do not want to misrepresent this as any kind of an official statement from the Trump White House. But it shows the mentality. And it shows their sense of victimization by the people of California because... We overwhelmingly supported Trump's opponent. I didn't, but mo most voters here did. <laughs> and that we are afflicted with this liberal disease that has to be wiped out by the Trump 
eradication? Well, this shows you the self-righteousness. And I don't know what kind of a person can say, well, we're not going to give you help from disaster relief because we don't agree with these policies that you embrace. But that's the kind of equation that we're seeing shape up. And we know, based on a 2012 Supreme Court decision, that this is not constitutional to withhold money from one fund because of a perceived violation of funding in another stream. But, of course, Trump, he doesn't worry about things like that. He's not bound by the laws that affect mortals like us. So now to the leaks in Washington, D.C., Now, there are many people speculating that Mike Flynn, who is the national security advisor, the top one in the Obama team, may be exiting the Trump administration very soon, as quickly as today, some people have said. Now, I had thought before the inauguration about setting up a website where people could place their wager or their guess as to who would be first to jump off the ship called Trump. (laughs) And I didn't get around to it, and I kind of kicked myself. It would be a fun thing to have in place right now. And if you're a web designer or you'd like to put something like that together, I'd be happy to uh, conspire with you and uh, split any revenues or just share the idea. I don't really care. But I think it would be fun. And uh, the odds are that Mike Flynn (laughs) may be the first to uh, be relieved of his duties in the Trump administration. Now, you know the hits on on Flynn, that he has been caught in contact with the Russian ambassador uh, before the team was sworn in. It violates a federal law about, about private citizens conducting foreign policy. And as if that weren't enough, Mike Flynn appears, now I have to say appears, to have lied about the contents of those conversations with the Russian ambassador. He said, oh, it was holiday greetings and let's set up a meeting in the new year. But here comes the murky part. And here's where I reference leaky Washington. The Washington Post, through an anonymous intelligence source, has told us that there are intercepts and transcripts of these phone calls between Flynn and the ambassador. And that the intercepts show that he discussed ways that Trump would ease the sanctions that Obama had imposed, and then he imposed another round, as you recall, uh, before he left office. Now, that does appear to be treasonous. Like the October surprise that Bill Casey engineered. John Zweibel from Hawaii emailed me over the weekend, and he remembered Casey. He remembered the October surprise. Thank you, John. (laughs) I did, too. It was one of the first things that came to my mind. So uh, Flynn is in hot water, but who heated the water to the boiling point? This is the open warfare between the intelligence community and key members of the Trump administration. This is Trump triggering a war with the deep state, whether he intended to or not. And while I think Mike Flynn is an idiot and I would not like to see him stay in power uh, a moment longer than he will, we know that Trump will find some other doofus to take his place. And in any event, I don't support, uh, you know, using uh, uh, these kinds of torpedoes that are available to members of the intelligence community to use without any real complication. And meanwhile, honorable whistleblowers either are in jail, in exile, or threatened with one or both. And this is the murky picture that we see in Washington, D.C. today. So Trump took Prime Minister Abe of Japan to Mar-a-Lago. That's this swanky joint in Florida that Trump bought for only $8,000 in cash. Do you know about that? He got the bank to give him a 105% loan for the property, and he buffaloed them. <laughs> on on his uh, uh, credit worthiness, if you will. He used liar loans. Yeah, that's what he did. No doc loans. At any rate, uh, while they were there on Saturday, a report came in that Kim Jong-un had uh, made a, a little rocket launch in order to ruin this happy dinner 
that Abe and Trump were having at Mar-a-Lago, and they're apparently in a public dining room. And so uh, Abe apparently gets an alert from his intelligence people in Japan. He shares it with the Donald. The Donald gets on a phone and calls somebody, and they're doing all this in public. And then there's another scene where people are using their cell phones in order to illuminate some piece of paper or other document that Trump and Abe were reviewing. And anybody with a nose for security knows that cell phones can be manipulated, that the cameras and mics can be turned on remotely, and you don't do that. And here's Trump, who ran against Hillary because of her failures on security, you know, the hackable website and her emails and all that stuff. But it's amateur hour with these people. And I think Trump made a big mistake because he and Abe interrupted their dinner to address reporters, and they gave Kim Jong-un what he desperately wanted the most from conducting this missile launch. It's a mid-range missile that went about 300 miles and fell into the ocean. And as one commenter on CNN noted, when North Korea launches a rocket, nobody, including North Korea, knows where it's going to land. And so, yes... North Korea is a rogue nation. It says it has nuclear weapons. I doubt that they are effective ones. And it's trying to develop missiles so it can threaten its neighbors. And that is a serious concern. But giving him attention in this manner, and Trump gravely saying that, you know, we stand with Japan in this moment of crisis, <laughs> that was the wrong move, at least in my humble opinion. So uh, I do want to reference just for fun, I think in my quote here, uh, it tells me, yes, the type of the missile. I love the names of missiles that come from North Korea. Uh, the, my favorite is the Taipo Dong. Uh, but this missile is a Puke Gook Song 2. <laughs> You know, they ought to check the English uh, pronunciation of their names before <laughs> they go ahead with them. So uh, anyway, uh, this is, uh, you know, like I say, it's almost comical and it's amateurish. If this was not the U.S. government, a, a major player, if not the dominant one, on the world stage today. And we have dinner patrons there at Mar-a-Lago who had cell phone pictures of this going on. <laughs> oh, my. Then they trotted out Steve Miller on the Sunday chat shows, which, by the way, I never watch. And this is not Steve Miller, the great blues guitarist who started making music in the 1970s and had hits through the 80s and 90s. No, this is Stephen Miller, who used to be the hatchet man for Senator Jeff Sessions. And now he is a top Trump advisor. He and Stevie Bannon uh, reportedly wrote the uh, executive order, the royal proclamation about the travel ban and the Muslim ban. And yet he is still, I guess, uh, enjoying confidence from the Donald because he was dispatched to show up on the talk shows on Sunday. And he offered some whoppers because he was responding to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and its review of Judge Robart's decision from Seattle, saying, hey, there's 72 cases of terroristic activity, that's his term, that can be linked to people who came to this country from the seven nations that Trump imposed the travel ban on. Only when you look at the 72 cases, dozens of them were not for terrorist activity. Dozens others simply do not meet the terms that he described. The list included people who were naturalized citizens, legal permanent residents, refugees, people whose citizenship was unknown, and a Canadian citizen and a Dutch citizen who was born in Iraq. And some of the immigration took place in the 1970s, as early as 1972. There are at least two dozen of these cases related to fraudulent visas, passport forgery, or making false statements. And we know that most of the domestic terrorism cases since 9-11 are a crock of shit. They are fabricated, contrived, uh, 
criminal actions that are based on usually a paid FBI informant. We detailed this to uh, some extent with Trevor Aronson in our in-depth interview last week. So the fact checkers at the Washington Post say that while the list does include some people who were convicted of providing material support, like money or personnel, to terrorist groups like al-Qaeda or al-Shabaab, it also includes people for other crimes that do not uh, rise to the level of terroristic behavior. And so Bannon and this guy Miller are creating their own alternative facts and alternative universe and trying to foist it on the rest of us. This guy Miller also made comments about the claims that Trump has made about millions of illegal votes that were cast against him in the November election. And they actually have found one woman, a legal resident but not a citizen. She was born in Mexico and has lived in the United States for over 20 years. And her name is Ortega. Rose Maria Rosa Maria Ortega. She's a mother of four who lives outside Dallas. And she voted twice that we know about in 2012 and 2014. Her lawyer said, well, she has a sixth grade education. She didn't know she wasn't legal. She can own property. She can serve in the military. She can get a job and pay taxes, but she can't vote. And she didn't know that. Now, They've thrown the book at Rosa Maria Ortega, an eight-year prison term, and likely deportation as a result. The last time they found a fraudulent case in Fort Worth, Texas, the individual got probation. That was in 2015. Does her status, does her ethnicity have anything to do with her prosecution and this eight-year sentence? You know the answer to that. Now, what's most inconvenient here is that Rosa Ortega voted for Republicans, including Ken Paxton, the attorney general who insisted on prosecuting her in order to grab these headlines and find a single case of voter fraud so that they can pretend that it happened millions of times. And if you want to look at a breakdown of the details of these claims, there's a great story at Vice News today by Alex Thompson. And Alex Thompson, I don't know if you're a male or a female, so I won't use a, a, a marker there. But Alex writes that about a quarter of American voters now believe that millions of votes were cast illegally last fall. And he, he or she looks at a Pew report from 2012 which is usually wielded by Trump to try to establish his point. But Vice talked to the company that does the targeting for the Democratic Party, and they found that uh, across the country there are 2.8 million people who have active registrations in more than one state and about 1.8 million dead people who have active voter registrations. And the company TargetSmart, did their research and said that, well, at most, maybe about 45,000 people could have voted twice in the 2014 election. Out of 83 million ballots cast, that's not significant. But the study also shows an equal number of potential double votes came from Republicans as from Democrats. And that, of course, is not what Trump says. He says all of the illegal votes went to his opponent. So, other experts say that the total potential for voter fraud in 2014 was somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 ballots out of 83 million cast. And the article references cross-check, the effort exposed by Greg Palast, run by Secretary of State Chris Kobach of Kansas, with a 30-state network to check for dual registrations. But as we know, that was uh, very carefully aimed at preventing Democrats from voting. It was not an even-handed effort to purge illegal registrants from the rolls. And once again, it is a solution in search of a problem that in, in essence does not exist. And I want to comment here or share a comment from Dick Atley, a listener who is also a subscriber. He lives in Maine. And he heard my recent interview with Norman Solomon talking about the uh, Democratic uh, repositioning, 
the race for chair of the Democratic National Committee and related matters. And Dick writes, it always interests me how activists who are involved in politics seem blind to the reality of Republican electronic electoral theft. Even if they might be aware of it, it seems to play no role in their worldview or strategic thinking. Everything is about affecting the election in some traditional way, and the blinders limit that to the usual kind of activity. In the Solomon interview, you mentioned the Wisconsin recount cutoff, which implicitly raises the issue, but Solomon didn't pick up on that, and you didn't bring it up further. And everything he said after that was predicated on normal Democratic political activity, as if having Keith Ellison take over the DNC would have any impact on Rovian theft or Democratic post-failure denial in future elections. Well, you're right, Dick. He goes on, I hate sounding like a one-track mind, but in fact... It's the you-name-it-pound name elephant underlying every single politics-type political discussion. Every single discussion of what Trump is or isn't doing would not be happening if the election hadn't been stolen. Thank you, Dick. I appreciate that. And I appreciate feedback from any listener at any time. You can always email peter at peterbcollins.com. And I want to invite you to become a subscriber like Dick Atley or Ethan Knox, Joe Clarici, Brian Massey. Benny Alto and all his pooches in Oregon. They are subscribers, and I invite you to join them. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com and help me out with the costs of producing and delivering this podcast every day. You pull on the menu button, then pull down, become a subscriber, takes you to the sign-up page. If you're allergic to PayPal, like Mike Collins, who just took out a new subscription over the weekend, we can help you there. There's a P.O. box listed on the sign-up page where you can send a check or money order or good old folding money. It all works at PeterBCollins.com. Well, the immigration crackdown continues to ensnare people at airports despite the fact that it's all on hold by court order. There's a man named Sid Bikanovar. He is an American citizen, was born here, and he has an exotic name. And that appeared to draw attention when he flew into Houston at the George H.W. <coughs> Bush Airport recently. He had left the country while Obama was president, but returned on January 30th. He was detained by customs, and despite the fact that he's an American citizen, and he works for the government for NASA, they kept pressuring him, telling him they had the authority to demand that he give them the password to their phone and let them examine it and copy it. And Bikanovar resisted, saying, Look, uh, I'm not allowed to share my government phone with anybody. But this became a battle between Customs and Border Enforcement and NASA. And I guess the space team lost. Because he decided not to let himself get arrested or detained. He did uh, relent. And what's really odd here is that Bakanovar is a member of Global Entry. That's a program run by the Customs and Border Patrol that allows people to undergo background checks before you leave. You, you basically have submitted, right? And therefore, you can breeze through the security lines, and uh, when you come back into the country, it should be, uh, you know, no questions asked. But... They did search his phone. They kept it for about half an hour, presumably copied the whole damn thing. And that's a cautionary note to all of us, because that demand may be made of you. And legally, you are not required to share the contents of your phone. But I don't know if I could resist if they're threatening to lock me up. There isn't really anything on my phone that would compromise me. But... On principle, I would resist until I couldn't resist anymore. About 600 people were rounded up for deportation nationwide last week. They told us it was about 100 in Los Angeles, then it became 160. And the government maintains this is routine, this is not part of some massive new sweep. But they are changing the ground rules. And so, for example, a Homeland Security official said the president's been clear in saying that we should be focused on removing individuals who pose a threat to public safety, who have been charged with criminal offenses. Now, it used to be convicted. Now, if you have simply been charged with a criminal offense, this administration believes that you are eligible for deportation. 
Out at Standing Rock, they had a warming trend that melted the snow, and they need to move the encampment one way or the other because it's going to shortly become a flood zone. And American veterans are now promising to return to Standing Rock. We saw skirmishes online over the weekend. Corporate media is not reporting it. But there was an effort to push people out of the encampment. Uh, The authorities opened up the bridge that they had blockaded. And at the same time, stark divisions are surfacing among those opposed to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And Dave Archambault, who is the leader of the Standing Rock Sioux, is really in the crosshairs. People are calling him Dapple Dave. And I don't have any reason to question his wisdom. He has urged people not to come out onto the north slope there and instead to support the Native Americans in their legal efforts in the courts. To me, that seems to make sense. But there are many people who just feel that this is the the place where they need to stand their ground. Frank Archambault, who is a relative of Dave, says, I feel abandoned. They just abandoned me and my family along with my new family here. Well, I hope this doesn't degenerate into, you know, just a a squabble among the people opposed to the pipeline. But that may happen. The Trump administration has quietly announced that they're dropping the federal government's challenge to the injunction that was issued against the Obama administration's rules on transgender bathroom use. And I find this so annoying. Now, on the one hand, I guess you can say the federal government shouldn't be regulating bathrooms, but I think this is an issue that can be handled on a person-by-person basis. And I think that it's simply used to arouse creepy feelings in the conservative base of people who support Donald Trump. And as Exhibit A, (laughs) I made a big mistake. I dropped by the Facebook page over the weekend called Melania Trump Fan Club. And the infographic at the top of the page when I got there, do you agree that allowing men into women's bathrooms places little girls in danger? Comment yes or no. And there's just a parade of people who said yes, 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 yes. And so I I was not very diplomatic. I posted, what a parade of idiots. Males who who identify as females aren't interested in sex in the girls' bathroom. They are interested in using the toilet like anyone else. Grow up. And, oh, did I create a little shitstorm there. (laughs) These people feel so self-righteous and so threatened and so, uh, what, entitled to their irrational fears that you cannot do anything to change them. Netanyahu, Benjamin, is coming to Washington. He'll be meeting at the White House with Trump on Wednesday. And in advance, the U.S. sending a little valentine via Nikki Haley, the inexperienced ambassador to the United Nations. And she blocked the U.N. appointment of a former Palestinian prime minister, Salam Fayed, to a U.N. job. She said Trump administration was disappointed that the new United Nations had sent a letter announcing this appointment. For too long, the U.N. has been unfairly biased in favor of the Palestinian Authority to the detriment of our allies in Israel, said Haley. The United States doesn't recognize a Palestinian state or support the signal this appointment would send within the United Nations. And going forward, the U.S. will act, not just talk, in support of our allies. So that's some real tough talk. I also want to point out that the New York Times had an excellent and detailed profile of Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, who will be a point man on their efforts to create a really big deal in the Middle East. And Jared Kushner is far from any kind of an unbiased or honest broker. And when you look at his past, he has spent summers in camps in Israel. Uh, He's known Netanyahu for quite a while. He is a, a partisan Zionist. And the idea that he can help broker a kind of pan Arab agreement that the Palestinians would be forced to admit to, that's the outline that I see so far, I think is ridiculous. So Netanyahu comes to Washington. He's trying to escape the scrutiny of three different uh, investigations into allegations of corruption, personal corruption. And so it'll be interesting to see how he and Trump get along and where they agree and where they don't. 
and seeing the handwriting on the wall here. I told you last week about Naftali Bennett predicting war with Gaza and that this time they want to finish the job. Well, this has led Hamas to appoint a militant hardliner to serve as their new leader. His name is uh, Yeya Sinwar. He's in his mid-50s. He spent about 21 years in Israeli prisons, and he is considered a, a, a militant who has killed Palestinians select, uh, suspected of collaborating with Israel. And he was one of the, the 1,000 Palestinian prisoners who were exchanged for the Israeli soldier Gilad Shalit uh, back in 2011. So he's been on the street now for a little over five years, and he is the new leader. And this promises to be uh, a fitful struggle if it does play out that way. Nice editorial in the New York Times today applauding three senior Republicans, James Baker, George Schultz, they both were secretaries of state, and Hank Paulson, the Treasury Sector uh, Secretary who helped tank the economy in 2008. They have formed what they call the Climate Leadership Council, and they support a carbon tax with dividends paid to average Americans. It's not a new proposal. It will seem new to Republicans, and it will seem downright dangerous to people in the Trump administration. Now, I've been busy here bashing a lot of Republicans, but it doesn't mean I turned a blind eye to the failings of Democrats. And I'm linking today to an interesting investigative report just published by Peter Byrne. Peter was on our program last week with an in-depth interview about his recent visit to Iraq. And in this report, he exposes the work of the husband of Dianne Feinstein, the senior senator from California. His name is Richard Blum, and he's a very wealthy investor guy. He's got his own banks. And he was a major investor, the largest investor, in ITT Educational Services. That's a for-profit college entity that went belly up last year. And Dick Blum and Dianne Feinstein apparently lost a lot of money in this, uh, some millions of dollars. But the taxpayers lost half a billion. That's money that uh, we forwarded or, or uh, you know, put out to cover government-backed loans for students at ITT universities. And we will never see that money again. I encourage you to read the article that details the conflicts of interest that Senator Feinstein has uh, engaged in to support her husband's business interests over her years in the Senate. And another ding on the Democrats. Tom Perez is now in a two-way battle to be chair of the Democratic National Committee. Keith Ellison is his leading opponent. And last week, Tom Perez was in. Uh, he was at a meeting in Kansas with about 20 Democratic Party officials, and he said. We heard loudly and clearly from Bernie supporters that the process was rigged in 2016, and it was. Well, you're not allowed to say that if you want to be DNC chair because you need the votes of the superdelegates, all of the establishment party leaders. So he quickly te tweeted out a walk back. I've been asked by friends about a quote and want to be clear about what I said and that I misspoke. And then he later tweeted, Hillary became our nominee fair and square, and she won more votes in the primary in general than her opponents. <laughs> Good luck with that one, Mr. Perez. And finally today, a little TV watching on HBO. I try to watch Bill Maher's show on Friday nights, and it's gotten more difficult because of his uh, blatant Islamophobia. And he's become a little hypocritical about it because while he supports uh, all kinds of uh, descriptions of his, you know, Muslim people as dangerous to the United States, he claims to be opposed to Trump's travel ban, or at least in his jokes, that's the... Uh, the message that you get. He had Al Franken on for an interview Friday night, and Al said that uh, many fellow senators, including some Republicans, think that Donald Trump, quote, is not right mentally and that he lies a lot. And John Oliver on his Sunday night show upped the ante by calling Trump a pathological liar, and he offered some evidence of some of the whoppers that Trump has told. And he is launching a new way to try to educate Donald Trump. 
He's running commercials on cable news channels that Trump is known to watch in the mornings. <laughs> and the first commercial would help educate him on the nuclear triad. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. It's available at YouTube. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling under.